Good evening everyone, welcome to this webinar. My talk is about AI practitioners. We call them data scientists nowadays. They are not regular developers, they have different approaches, toolboxes and mindsets. Uh, I call them data people who have engineering background, math background and statistics background. In this webinar, we are going to mention how developers and data scientists are different than each other. So, this is a software developer's guide to becoming data scientist. Let me introduce myself first. This is Shefik. I have been working as a software developer for a fintech company since 2010. I received my Master of Science degree in Computer Science from Galatasaray University. A popular football club in Turkey it has same name and logo. This might be familiar for you. Also, I have a personal blog. My name plus uh, first letter of my surname. Sefix.com. I post mostly uh, machine learning related articles here. Uh, and you can contact me on Twitter with my surname. And finally, you can find my uh, open source projects on my GitHub profile. Suppose that uh, as a developer, we have a task classifying these uh, two images, apple and orange. How can we classify them? Uh, color might be helpful. If red pixels are greater than orange pixels, then it's an apple. Otherwise, it's an orange. Uh, what if you have black and white images? Color-based previous approach won't work. Uh, so what could you do in this case? We can check its shape. If its shape is sphere, then it's an orange. Otherwise, it's an apple. What if a third vegetable exists? A uh, third one is a uh, mango. And it has a sphere shape. Also, it has both red and orange pixels. Still, we can find a solution, but it becomes complex and complex with rule-based approaches. Let's focus on another example. Uh, this, is, this is a dog, Chiheha, and this is a muffin. They are not similar. Let's classify them. Uh, it's difficult, right? <laughs> As a developer, we add many if statements in our programs. We develop rule-based systems and solutions. Here, machine learning offers you more creative solutions and without rules. We just fit data, fit a dog picture and say this is a dog, then fit a muffin picture and say this is a muffin. And a machine learning system finds rules inside a black box. Otherwise, programs will neither be clean nor understandable. I like this meme, it explains what happens, number of rules increase. It just checks username and password. <laughs> in traditional programming, we fit data and algorithm, in other words, uh, decision rules, and program returns an output. For example, in our previous slide, we fit username and password validation algorithm and it will check my input data uh, and return true or false. On the other hand, in machine learning, I fit data and output and machine learning algorithm creates the decision rules. I mean that instead of adding new rules to classify apple and orange, I will fit apple and orange images and say this is an apple, this is not, this is an orange. As a developer, you got some logic, you got some business rules and it runs as written always. Uh, it's stable. We don't expect it to be changed on the production line. As a data scientist, you model some problem and you see that it works for production data, then you deploy to the production line, but in time it might be decay. You might remodel it with a new structure or retrain it by feeding new instances. This is a typical neural cell, 
uh, they come together and build neural networks or deep learning systems more popular term for today it has some inputs and connected weights we need to multiply inputs and connected weights and if some is greater than a threshold it returns true uh, otherwise it returns false how could you code this unit as a developer i write a for loop for uh, from 0 to 3 and multiply uh, input and weight values for that index and append it to do some sigma let's have a break what is deep learning actually uh, Jeff Dean from Google described it as uh, when you hear the term deep learning just think of a large deep neural networks deep refers to the number of layers typically but I like Barbara's definition more, much more. It describes it as uh, my favorite definition of deep learning is matrix multiplication. A lot of matrix multiplication. Turn back to the neural unit. Really, we can adapt uh, the Barbara's definition in our neural cell. If input x and weights are column vectors, then uh, transposed weights times inputs will be the same value we don't have to write a for loop and uh, this approach is uh, cleaner than the for loop approach it's not just clean uh, this approach uh, also performs better what if I say uh, it overperforms uh, almost 100 times this is because why Python and R languages are much more popular than Java in data world. Because uh, Python is object oriented language, but it also supports matrix operations. But in Java, even though you can define a matrix variable, you have to apply a for loop to find the uh, multiplication. Uh, most of you might know Alan Kay, he is the inventor of the object oriented programming in 70s also he invents the graphical user interface before the apple he believes that people who are really serious about software should make their own hardware as a developer your code will run on cpu servers uh, most probably here in uh, as a data scientist you can run your machine learning code on CPU or graphical processing units, GPUs. Uh, GPUs are actually designed for gamers, but computer graphics are expressed as uh, matrices and we can run our machine learning code faster with uh, GPUs. Uh, we should pay $10,000 for a good GPU today. If a matrix uh, including matrix items we call it tensor and tensor flow name comes from here and we mentioned uh, that deep learning is a matrix multiplication at this point google developed tensor processing units tpus as a hardware for machine learning practitioners it offers you uh, faster calculation than gpus but you have to use it on a cloud google cloud and it's not for sale in traditional programming we apply test driven approaches we even write our unit tests before the code and code changes cannot be deployed to production if unit tests are not passed but in machine learning uh, you prepare yourself to fail because we want to fail but I mean Suppose that we developed a mobile application and it classifies gender of photos and we fit 100 pictures uh, in a class uh, in the training step and the application classifies 100 percent but uh, we go to outside of the class and uh, test the application for another 100 person and in this case it classifies only 30 percent in the second scenario it classifies 8% for both pictures in the class and outside this is better 
making mistakes is good in machine learning and it avoids overthink and overthink is uh, you can think memorizing instead of learning you have to learn the concept uh, to solve the math problem if you memorize uh, you most probably uh, fail this is our secret we always uh, skip unit tests choosing the right tool for the right job is important in our studies algorithms are tools for data scientists uh, we will find solutions for two types of problems uh, there is a supervisor or there's not uh, there are different algorithms for these different types of problems for example uh, id3 uh, is a decision tree algorithm and it can be applied for classification problems you cannot apply it for regression similarly regression trees uh, can be applied for regression problems and it cannot be applied for the classification problems at this point uh, neural networks can be applied for all types of problems doesn't matter supervised or unsupervised uh, regression or classification it's like swiss army knife you can use it for all types of problems neural networks and deep learning are very powerful algorithms but they are not explainable they are totally black boxes we don't know what actually happens inside this black box on the other hand decision trees are explainable machine learning models suppose that this is the built decision tree and your decision is very range cut you already know that uh, you make this decision because it's not extremely windy and it's windy and it's also raining the decision uh, can be read from down to top clearly from a developer from anyone we can apply boosting for decision tree results decision tree algorithms and this makes decision trees uh, as strong as deep learning uh, the boosting uh, procedure is easy we will build a decision tree and build another one based on previous one's errors and uh, in each step uh, loss uh, will decrease this is called gradient boosting decision trees or gradient boosting uh, machines you can think that as uh, poor employees come together and they can move heavy rocks on the other hand individual employee cannot move a heavy rock this is the typical explanation of gradient boosting deep learning and gradient boosting machines which one is better uh, in 2015 there are 29 challenges in Kaggle and the uh, winning solutions are announced in its blog uh, 17 winning algorithms are based on gradient boosting machines which is uh, more than 50 percent on the other hand 11 solutions are based on deep learning deep neural networks and nine solutions are using both gradient boosting machines and deep learning gradient boosting machines dominates uh, the challenge among data people nowadays but saying that gradient boosting machines is better or stronger than deep learning is not fair to be honest gradient boosting machines winning challenges have structured data set whereas deep learning winning challenges have unstructured data set such as uh, voice uh, or image uh, you should apply uh, deep learning for unstructured data uh, and you should apply gradient boosting machines or random first uh, decision tree based algorithm for structured data on the other hand uh, you can apply uh, linear models uh, for very small problems as well my talk is over here uh, I have mentioned uh, how different mindsets uh, developers and data scientists have. Developer 
should change their mindset because their approaches and toolboxes are not valid in data world. Thank you for watching and joining this webinar. You can contact me on Twitter uh, or my contact details exist in my blog. I hope you enjoyed this webinar. Uh, hope to see you next time. By the way, if you enjoyed this webinar, do not forget to subscribe to this channel to receive notifications for new ones.